And I remember the first couple weeks, you know, all your friends are kind of still into the things that you are. Your friends are your friends. But what I noticed was there was a lot of um, animosity towards me, at least. And the dumb part about it, that I think about it now, being back, think about it now at being 26 is, you know, even uh, the other coaches from other sports were talking smack. You know, and like, who does that to, uh, you know, a 15 year old or 16 year old or 17 year old at the time? Um, what is it to prove, you know? So you're going to face these people that are just complete. They hope you do bad when you do well. They hope you do bad and they're happy you do bad. And that was kind of my first uh, outlook into what it was to be an adult and see how people really are um, in terms of certain ways. And not everybody's always rooting for you in your corner. So when you're down and you're knocked down and you see people that are still rooting for you, those are the real friends. Those are the real family members. Those are the real people. You know, I had friends that would help me get in the car and get out of the car. We'd go out to a campfire or whatever it was that we were doing in high school. You know, I was the guy rolling around in crutches. So that first month is going to be the most psychologically taxing and mentally tough time of this whole process um, you know you're gonna want to be stubborn about things but listen to your surgeon listen to your physicians don't do more than they tell you not to do and whatever they tell you to do keep doing it you know this is the time where you this is the time where I at least got really into understanding biochemistry and understanding what I could do supplementally to prevent um, you know loss of muscle help you know speed the process along, you know, um, to figure out what you need to eat, what you need to do, what things you need to take care of. And personally, I would separate it into two categories. One being understanding the nutritional needs of what you are going to get back together, but also the other half of the coin being what are my hobbies? What do I like to do? What can I spend my free time doing? And for me, it was just music. So I just enjoyed music. And that's really when I got into it. And having that mental separation from, okay, uh, here's the athlete part of me. Here's the creative side of me. Allowed me to see what it is that I like, who it is that I am. And be able to give me that mental relief, even if it was just for a couple hours a day, from the whole ordeal of, my legs messed up. I can't perform at the optimal level of, that I want to. And kind of that moment to move doubts behind my head and, you know, give you that confidence in what it is that you like to do and who it is that you are. Uh, most of the time, athletes are just athletes. You know, they are, you know, I'm not saying just athletes, but they're so overwhelmed and encompassed in the idea of being an athlete. Sometimes they lose track of who they are and the things that they like to do. And there's nothing wrong with that because you're focused as a sport but sometimes you got to take a step back and see oh yeah i like to do this you know whether it's you know painting uh music whatever hobby that it is you have is the things that you enjoy and give you that mental creativity and space to allow you to develop more as an individual so that was that first month for me um second month you get the brace off you start doing minimal rehab the two to four month range was difficult in the sense that knowing you know, before I could squat 500 pounds, you know, without worrying too much, I could rep out 315. And all of a sudden now I'm doing 25 pounds on, you know, the rehab leg press at the therapist's office. So it was, you know, um, aggravating in that extent, uh, in that instance. And you kind of work back and you just have to take it in as a step by step process, especially if you're younger. I know one year seems a lot but looking hindsight looking back it really wasn't it flew by real fast 
So the fact that I was able to stay on track, you know, they told me to do, you know, body assisted leg extensions. You know, I was doing that all day long. You know, I was moving it, not doing it, hurting it to that extent. You know, they told me to move around to do that. I was doing it and I was following it to the T. And I think one of the big things that played into having the quick recovery that I did was having a person in my life who understood not only the anatomy, but the physiology, you know, the chemical pathways, the nutritional aspect, the flexibility, mobility, and agility aspect of things. I really had a team behind me. And the key player was, you know, my pops, who's a Cairo as well. And ultimately helped me choose what I want to do in my future of being a chiropractor. So he was always there doing the rehab with me at the gym, moving through it. And not only with this injury. I mean, I've had many other injuries. You know, I've torn my shoulder. I've dislocated my arm um, so severely that it was you know, a partial tear of the bicep. Um, ankle injuries left and right. Um, knee injury. Uh, back injuries, you know, uh, partial disc herniation. So these are all the things that personally I've been treated by chiropractic care. Um, neck injuries, you know, concussions, you know, broken nose. Um, you know, it's one of those things that has given me not only the experience and understanding what the injury is, but knowing what it is to go through that whole situation. So two to four months is going to be the aggravating portion of it you've already accepted it but it's like you're putting your foot on the throttle and you're idling it you're like oh, okay okay little by little all right now you just creep the car out of the garage you know you just put the axle on but you don't know if it's stable or not you know you were just going 200 miles an hour and you blew an axle and almost you know tore the car in half and you kind of have that hesitation and it's good to have that hesitation listen to it Make sure not to go past it and listen to your therapist, listen to your um, rehab individuals. Um, in my case, it was a chiropractic physician. And, you know, along the way, you'll see people, you know, start being uh, casting you aside type of thing. Um, you learn real fast who your friends are and who aren't your friends. And I was blessed to have friends that didn't do that, family members that didn't do that. But everybody's situation is different. If you find yourself in that situation, always reach out, ask for help, talk to people, inform yourself, um, get help when you need it. And the two to four month range was tough. So moving from the four to six month range, because um, my surgeon was saying that I should be back to 100% at six months was their average recovery time, you know, and along the way, you know, you have muscle atrophy. Uh, the muscles get smaller and you're kind of getting frustrated with it little by little. So what I did during most of my injuries was, okay, my legs are out of commission. What else can I focus on? I can still, you know, lift upper body stuff. I can still do certain things. You know, I can still lift weights, keep myself active. You know, my big thing was, okay, I'm going to focus on core. I'm going to focus on stabilizing myself, the stability muscles, the weird muscles that I hadn't really worked a lot. Um, and kind of going into it with that aspect. And really, I kind of polished off different things, different parts of it, of uh, my body that weren't up to par. Even the small accessory muscles that I didn't use as much. So the four to six or four to five is when you can really start, you know, you're driving 20, 30 miles an hour, right? You know, every so often testing 50 miles an hour. And then, you know, you have that one moment that and kind of really test things out and don't go too crazy don't go too fast um don't go too crazy too fast in this time and make sure to keep following rigorously to the t of what they tell you to do don't do too much too little do exactly what they tell you to do and how they tell you to do it because the worst thing that can happen at this point is you tear it again and when you tear it again you're back to square one that's the last thing you want to do. Um, I knew that in the back of my head, but at the same time, you have that that voice. It's like, you know, I can I can do it. But at the same time, you're like, ah, you know, so kind of understand that that's going to be a huge aspect of what's going on in your head and that mental portion of you of not knowing whether you can do it, but you feel like you can do it. You know, you used to do it. So am I going to try to do it? But then am I going to go back to square one? So keep that 
necessary fear at the moment in your head. Um, and you'll realize by the time that the five to six month time comes around, you can start letting go of that little by little. Don't let it overpower you. Don't let it take control of you, but let it guide you in the decisions you make. That hesitation in terms of ability to move and stress the joint is good in terms of it's not going to let you go too far off the edge, but don't hold on to it as you're progressing. Know where you should be and know what it is you need to be doing to be able to be advancing at the systematic steps of that approach for your rehab of ACL injury. So, you know, the golden day comes six months, right? And, you know, you could drive 100 miles an hour, right? But you haven't entered the race yet. In the race, everybody's driving 150, 200 miles an hour. So little by little, you enter, you know, the regional competition, driving 125, you know, district competition and, you know, 125, regional 150, you're driving. And then, you know, you come to the race, the cream of the crop, whatever it is the sport. And there's everybody has their state tournaments. And, you know, I felt really good. I felt like I had done the preparation and I did it all. And, you know, I had really, really good competition in that state tournament. You know, I wore my braces. Um, I never wrestled without it. Um, and when I felt comfortable, I could wrestle without it. I still had some sort of knee stability, whether it was a wrap or something like that, that they often offer. And it just gave me security and kept my joints warm. So, you know, come, you know, the first one bout and I win second bout, I win third one going on to the finals and I won't lie. I was still hesitant in the finals about it. You know, I had a really good competitor, um, really strong guy, really fit individual. And, you know, my leg felt comfortable, but I didn't. And in a way, I think that was good because I knew that I could push it, but I didn't want to over push it and I ended up winning, taking the state tournament title. And looking back on it, it was having that team of individuals that are supporting you, whether it's just one person, you know, whether it's your dad, mom, grandma, whoever it is after that surgery to support you, your friends, uh, kind of help you along the process. Cause the most difficult portion of it is understanding your own limits after you've surpassed your limits, you know? And the biggest thing for me was that I took away from this is the importance of a warm up what it is to really get your body to the optimal temperature to be able to perform correctly. And that one 20 minute nap on concrete was what cost me six months of my time. So when it comes into preparing or uh, when it comes into the preparation of performing at a high level, make sure that you take care of every aspect of it. You know, people make fun of you for, uh, I used to have a duffel bag and take my food with me. I had my meals partitioned out. Um, I knew what worked for me and what didn't work, what carbs were great for me, what carbs would make me fall asleep, um, when to take my vitamins, when to take my minerals, um, how to perform at the optimal level. So you know what's best for you and make sure that you don't slip up like that because it can cost you a whole injury and even um, performing at different levels and even a title of sorts. So um, that's just my personal story in terms of going from competing to being stationary almost for six months, uh, but still doing my rehab and coming back to the level that I once was. And you can do it. You can definitely do it. Just understand the mental toll it's going to take on you, the hardships that you're going to go through, the psychological stress that it's going to put on you, and understand that it's perfectly acceptable. You know, understand that we are human and we do doubt ourselves and in those moments you're going to need somebody in your life to help you out with that and it's going to be difficult it's going to be tough but it is very doable so um, i hope this video was informative um and guiding you on your choices and how to go through it what you need to do and how you need to do it so um, if you enjoy this video please like share and subscribe um because we'll keep talking about personal cases like this and what it was to go through and 
how devastating it was. So thank you and have a great day.